My name is Leo Sobalski and I'm with Donna Kay. She's just published a book and we're really excited. So Donna, we're going to start with a little bit of a biography. Where were you born? I was born in Besboro, so just outside of Dawson Creek. And so you grew up in a farming family, correct? I did, yes. And so the mainstay of your reading was in what magazine? Because I we shared that. The Western Producer. Yeah, I was a young co-op. <laughs> and uh, back in the day, that was like <laughs> probably the only outlet for a, a person living in an isolated area. I mean, there's no internet or anything like that. So yeah, the Western Producer was such a big part of my life. Yeah, and you wrote probably to pen pals and stuff like that. I did, yeah. Well. Yeah, and um, yeah, I was uh, I was poet laureate for a while with the young oh. co-op <laughs> club. So that's yeah, a I real mean. honor. That's <laughs> yeah. a real honor. In my family, we also had the Western producer, and yeah. it, it was always read from front to back. So I probably read a few of your articles you, you may along. Have. Yeah, it was really good. Did you ever enter your name in Home's uh, Loving Hearts for a date? Yeah, the, you know, I'm not, I don't know if our family had that in our ah, house. Not, because that was in the Western Oh, producer. that was in, that was part that of was it. The, I part probably of only it. went to the Young Co-op ah, pages, that was it. Yeah, so you, you missed a few good dates. <laughs> I guess I have. Well, what made you become a writer? Because from Bessboro to Dawson, did you move around a lot? Uh, only when I went to school. So really, um, I grew up, uh, in Besbro and then went to school in Kamloops and married, came home and uh, raised my kids right beside where my parents were and, and was there right up until, well, 12 years ago. And was there a big difference between living in Kamloops than living in Dawson Creek? Well, you know, I've always loved cities and so mm -hmm. for me it was pretty exotic to go to a city. And then I, you know, I have uh, been to, I've been to UVic in yep. UBC. So, um, I really, I've always really loved the cities, but I always return to the peace. Well, that's incredible. You must have drank water from the I peace. guess I must have. You must have repeatedly. Your first book was a poetry book. Is that correct? It was, yeah. I have two books prior to uh, Summer of the Horse, and they're both poetry. And what made you become a poet? Because it's very rare that you go somewhere and someone says, I'm a poet, you know. It's true. Um, what made you? Like, I think I just, I, I can't remember when I didn't write and I think when I was very young I probably wrote in all genres but then when I got to be a teenager poetry seemed to be uh, where I felt most at home and since then I, I've been writing uh, poetry and I never really actually thought that I would move outside of that genre but um, but I did. Yeah. Okay we're going to go into this um, Donna's book Summer of the Horse. What made you go into this because it's, it's really, a, a, I, I've started reading it and it's really captivating. Thank what you. What was the first first thing that made you get into this book? You know, it started um, really as a collection of nature essays and originally that's what I thought I was I was doing was I was writing about wilderness and I was writing about um, you know a fairly major change in my life when when I left my marriage and uh, so wilderness in that way as well so physical wilderness metaphysical and then it just happened that um, this horse got injured uh, for which I felt fairly responsible for. And so I watched this, I had to take care of the horse, watch mm -hmm. the wound heal, and it became the narrative thread that went mm. through the book. Yeah, I, I've seen that. What was the horse's name and what, what sort of attracted to you, uh, to the horse? Well, his, his name is Comet and mm -hmm. uh, luckily he's doing great. He survived, but um, the only thing that attracted me to the horse was that he got injured and mm. I had to uh, spend the summer taking care of him. But then, of course, once I was doing that, you know, fell in love with the horse. What kind of characteristics uh, uh, does the horse have that you sort of identify with? Because reading it there, he's kind of a bossy horse. Isn't he, he is a bossy horse. And when uh, Wayne first got him, the person who sold it to Wayne said uh, it was a man's horse. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I didn't really know what that meant, you know, mm -hmm. it kind of irked me that, well, you know, I, I know a lot of women who are really good with horses, but um, when this happened, I was, yeah, I was pretty, I was pretty worried because I thought, well, yeah, it's a pushy horse and I'm not pushy and I don't know anything about horses and I don't know if I can do this. Um, but then, you know, I learned he had soft spots and that he, you know, he wasn't always as sure of himself as he pretends to be. And he was also the lowest horse in the pecking order. That's why he got injured originally. He was the one the horses were picking on, so. Mm -hmm. Were you ever afraid of, of him? 
Oh, absolutely. The, fir the first uh, few days that I had to go out and, and uh, mm -hmm. hose them, and yeah, I was terrified. I'm not a horse person, and I'm still not really. Mm. But it sounds like you've become really affectionate with this with this horse comment. Yes, well, and I think all horses. I mean, a lot of the book is about our relationship with horses, and how amazing it is that mm -hmm. horses will let us do what they let us do to mm -hmm. them. And um, so I examine that. I'm interested in human non-human animal relationships, so that came out. So yeah, I, I admire horses a lot. Do you sometimes think animals are nicer than people? Well, what I think is that they're every bit as intelligent, and I think they're every bit as um, aware, maybe not in the same ways that we are. So I wouldn't say they're better or worse, but I would say that they, they deserve probably a greater respect than what we give them. Going through your book, Common at times is a little bit of a bully, isn't he? Yes. Yeah, he can be. But you know, sometimes you see that in humans too, where the uh, people who get picked on sometimes turn around and try and pick on someone else and Comet probably fits that a little bit. Well that's really wonderful because something that I really liked about it is it's really written descriptively. Like I'm, I'm, I'm going through it and I'll probably read it in one read. I tend to read one book all night. Right. So I'll probably read your book right from the beginning. Now your relationship with Wing, so you've gone through all his trips I gather. I have. Yeah, I don't go out for the whole summer, anything like that. I usually go out for like one, two week trip. I think the longest I've been on the trail is maybe 17 days, so yeah. Do you like cooking out on the trail and walking with the horses? I love, I love being outside. I've always been um, sort of comfortable in mm -hmm. the outdoors, but I wouldn't say um, the, the trail is a whole different kettle of fish. There's one picture in there where it says something about a rain and you look really happy. Do you remember that scene? Yeah, I mean, it's exhilarating to be out there and it's exhilarating to know that you actually, you know, ascended a pass or got through, uh, you know, some bad weather and you're still, you're still alive and you feel really alive when you're, mm -hmm. when you're out there, so. Have you taken Comet on the trail yet? I have rode Comet since the injury when he was ready to go back on the trail, then when I go, that's the horse I ride. Mm -hmm. So there is a bond between There you. is, yeah. Yeah. You have a selection that you're going to read. What is the selection about? Well, I thought since uh, Comet is the narrative thread going mm -hmm. through, um, and I'll just read for five minutes. Yeah. So what I'll read is after the horse is injured, um, it was during a, the Sweetwater 905 Arts Festival, and that was partly why I was distracted and didn't pay enough attention, and the horses were kept in overnight where they shouldn't have been. And I woke up the next morning, we found the injured horse, um, but then I had to go to the airport to uh, pick up a guest for the festival. And so Brian, an artist who was staying um, with us during the summer and helping out, he, uh, he was there. So when I mentioned Brian, that's who that is. Mm -hmm. So this is after, after the injuries happened, mm -hmm. the vets have come and gone. After I return from the airport with John, I put on my gumboots and go out to look at Comet. I figure if I spread out my hands, it would take 15 of them to cover Comet's wound. And where the wound is deepest, where the muscles are cut and exposed, is a hollow so deep that if I lifted the hide to fully expose it, I think I could stick my head inside. Horses have a lot of mass, Emily says when she comes over for a look. It's not as bad as it seems. Good, I say, because it looks like the horse will die. Before I met Wayne, Emily and I didn't talk about horses. We might be outside, even walking through her horse pasture, but the interests we shared were more toward art and relationships. We were figuring out life, as Emily likes to say, like we are sane or something. Emily was 11 when she got her first horse. And you wanted the horse, I say. It wasn't someone else's idea. Oh God, no, I wanted a horse since I could ever remember. I was real little. How did you know you wanted a horse? Well, don't you always know when you want something? I think of Plato's allegory of the cave, how if I were born chained to one spot with only a blank wall in front of us, we'd have no thoughts at all. You can't know what something is if you don't know what it isn't. Well, I say, you can't want something you've never known. Well then, I saw a horse. The first horse I saw that I remember was when I was about four. It was at the relatives, and they put me on this pony, and apparently I wasn't afraid, but they took me off because I didn't want my brother on it. I remember being a little bruised up about that, because I was riding in the front, and Brian was riding behind me. He was, 
he was a year younger, and we were trotting around in this little fenced area. It was probably very tiny, but you know, when you're a kid, it's huge. And then they took the pony away because I wouldn't share it. I was kicking up a bit, and it would go beyond a walk, and my brother would fall off, and that wasn't good. That's the first time I remember riding a pony. You did that on purpose to get him to fall off? No, I wasn't trying to make him fall off. I just wanted to go faster, and I didn't care if he fell off. It was a consequence of going faster. Anyway, they took the pony away. That was a start, and after that, I always wanted a horse, and finally, I got one. Anyone who has seen Emily on a horse will say it's a beautiful thing, a muscled union of animated energy. There are antibiotics that Comet will need to take orally for 10 days, fly repellent to be applied around the outer rim of the wound, furazone to the wound itself, and a salve to be used in case the furazone runs down Comet's leg and creates a rash. The hosing is to begin right away. When Wayne acquired Comet, the owner told me, it's a man's horse. Try telling Emily that is what I thought at the time, but I'd kept my mouth shut. What irked me wasn't just the implication in his remark that a man could handle a horse better than a woman. It was also that, as with so many things that bugged me, I felt an undercurrent of worry that it could be true. And now, hosing a man's horse, a horse I am in no way comfortable with, twice a day, all summer long. Brian has already strung garden hoses together so they reach the corral where Comet is to be confined. confined. Brian can see my hesitation. He hands me the hose. He's attached my watering wand to the end of the hose and my first thought is, that's my expensive watering wand. You may as well start now, he says. You're the one who will be doing this. And it's true. When Wayne's expedition leaves in a few days, Brian is going too. What did I know about wounded horses? What did I know about horses at all? There goes my summer, I say to Wayne when he returns from Vancouver just a few days before he'll hit the trail. And as always when I complain, he nods. Wayne is always sympathetic. Also, not once has he suggested that this might not have happened had I bothered to check the horses. In fact, I've never heard Wayne place blame on anyone. I have never heard him speak ill about another being, human or otherwise. I wish I could say the same for myself. Well, what should we do about it, he says. And as always, I don't know. On the face of it, the answer is simple. I can't be with Wayne and remain discon disconnected from how he makes his living. As long as I live in this house, I am a part of what goes on. I can leave or I can stay and I don't want to leave. I don't want Emily to take care of Comet either, which she's offered to do. Why don't you bring him to my place, she said. The grandkids will be coming and going all summer. They'd love to help. I have my mother's stubborn pride. Maybe I don't want Emily to see me give up. Maybe I enjoy being a martyr, which has been suggested a time or two. You need to be more generous, Wayne has said, when I've refused someone's offer to assist. Maybe I need to prove I can do this. Maybe, and this is a thought that settles inside me, maybe I'm curious to know what it is to heal a wound. That's incredible. And how long ago was that? Uh, that was the summer of 2013. So, so you've had four years four to years. produce this book. Yeah, I started like some of the essays prior to that, but yeah, it's been, it, I'm a slow writer, so I would say actually some of these essays started back in 2008 takes me a while. Yeah, you describe Comet and Sally. Uh, Sally is? Well, Sally was Emily's horse, and uh, as the summer progressed, Comet just looked really pathetic in the pen where he was being held, and uh, no other horses could really go near him because we couldn't have the wound open up, but uh, Sally was a little more uh, submissive, and so we thought she would be okay with Comet, so I bought Sally so that Comet would have a friend for the summer. Yeah. How did Wayne deal with all this? Because you, you were not with him all summer. You were basically taking care of Comet. Yeah, that summer I didn't, I don't think I went into uh, Mayfield or the trail at all. So, um, yeah, I mean, Wayne was at a, a meeting when the injury happened. He came back. Three days later, he went in. So that whole summer, basically, uh, you know, sometimes I send pictures up with clients that were going up so we could see how Comet was doing. But by the time Wayne came out, 
uh, Comet was pretty much healed. So he was, uh, he wasn't, he wasn't there. Yeah, and um, Comet's personality, did it change during the year? He got, um, well, I mean, we got much more comfortable with each other. I think he did get a little more, um, I don't know, maybe a, a little more uh, wanting to be comforted and that sort of thing. Like maybe he let his guard down a little bit. And, and uh, yeah, I remember the next summer, uh, Comet went back on the trail and I hadn't seen him for a month or so. And I flew in to go on the trail for two <laughs> weeks and Comet saw me, he was off uh, grazing and he came over and that was like a huge compliment to me because horses generally once they're gone to eat they don't really care but he saw me and recognized me and came back so that was a nice nice moment so you're a little bit like Comet's godmother <laughs> I guess so now now you know to be honest I mean Comet yeah he still likes to see me but it's not it's not probably as evident as it was at, at the very beginning because I don't really spend a lot of time with the horses Normally. Well, that's really wonderful because as a child, you never spent a lot of time with horses, did you? No, we always had horses, but oh, I always got, I always got bucked off or something. So I was kind of, um, I was frightened of horses really mm -hmm. because of those experiences. My dad had bought a Shetland pony, which, um, you know, they're really kind of cranky. They're small, they but they're cranky. And they have so, sharp teeth. Yeah, so it probably wasn't, you didn't have far to fall, but you definitely fell. Yeah. And so my uh, love for horses didn't just, it never took. How did your kids react to you writing this book? Because it's really a big shift because I remember interviewing you a few years ago with right. your first book. And your first book was something about a, somewhere a fire? Somewhere a fire. I remember um, this is a yeah. really massive change. It is, yeah. And yeah. I like your imagination because you are educated and you can refer back. Yeah, well, you know, um, one of the reasons I tried the genre of nonfiction was because the poetry was... Uh, for whatever reason, maybe I was, wasn't was getting the uh, sort of solitude that I needed. So I wasn't really having a lot of success with poetry. And so I thought, um, you know, maybe maybe I need to try a different genre, which I'd never thought that, you know, I would I would be able to do. And then the other thing is I went, I got my MFA at UBC and you had to show proficiency in three different genres. So mm -hmm. it kind of forced me to try as well. And now I think, I don't know, like maybe. I think you made it. I think yeah. you've done an amazing job. Yeah, well, thank you. And something else, though, uh, like in Dawson Creek, you don't expect people to look at poetry, do you? You know, you go into the post office and there's a lot of country people, and you wonder, are they going to read poetry? But I believe that they're going to read this. Yes, I, I hope so. I think it's going to be a bestseller. Well, thank you. And you are published through? Uh, Harbor Publishing. That's there, good. How yeah. did you get accepted by Harvard? Because it's kind of hard to get accepted. Mm -hmm. Well, I sent this manuscript to a few different publishers, and they were all like, you know, complimentary. But at the end, sometimes I'd wait a year, and yes, they'd yes. say, "No, sorry, it just doesn't quite fit." Um, and then I, I was just frustrated one day, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to submit via email to Harbor. I mean, mm -hmm. what, what can yeah. I lose? Yeah. And people said, oh, you know, you probably you should really not do it that way. But I did. And it was only maybe four weeks later they got back and said they wanted it. So I was just lucky. Have you read parts already to people? Have um, you had any response? Well, I've had some people who've already read the book. Mm -hmm. um, what is it, the response? It, it, good so far. <laughs> we'll see. It's early. It just came out um, like officially uh, last week. Yeah, So I imagine I, I have a ways, a ways to go. Yeah. Are you going to read parts to comment this uh, spring? I hadn't thought of that. You should. <laughs> well, okay. I bet you'd love your voice. I'll say Leo told me to. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yeah, please do. Okay. And uh, so uh, what advice would you give to young people starting out? Because you're now an accomplished writer. You've actually gone to the publisher, not just self-published. What would you advise um, young people that want to be authors? I guess what I would say is, um, you know, you really have to be writing because you love to write, not because you want to be published, because getting published isn't that easy. No. And um, it's not like it can't happen, but, you know, I think a lot of us, we get very um, anxious, and we think that the goal of writing is to have a book, have something mm -hmm. tangible in our hands. But that can sometimes, you know, go sideways if you decide to publish too early. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, there might be reasons why you're not being accepted by a publisher. It might be because you still have some, you know, craftsmanship mm -hmm. that you have to develop. So I would say, you know, write for the pleasure of it and then probably the publishing will 
will follow and read a lot. You know, you, mm -hmm. can't, um, you can't write in a vacuum. And it's so wonderful now for young writers because there's um, uh, Wattpad and um, mm -hmm. other, you know, forums online. It's not like when I was a kid and all I had was a Western producer. Now writers can go on the internet and they can join groups and they can get, you know, feedback. You're going to have to have a thick skin. That's another thing I would say if you're going to be a writer. Not everyone's going to like what you How write. How burden is education? Because I mm. notice your referrals in your book, they're, they're rich, you know. Like, what would you say to a young person? Go to university or just read? What, what would your advice be? I think be? just reading and writing, although it would depend what you want to write about. If you're going to write about something that um, requires a little bit of research, then uh, you have to read even more. But and going to school and studying in those areas, like I'm, I'm interested in philosophy, mm -hmm. and the philosophy courses I've taken at university have been uh, so valuable. Like I don't think mm -hmm. I would be able to think in the way I think mm -hmm. if I hadn't taken those courses. They really open up your mind. So there's nothing wrong with um, with education. That's for sure. I think it's mm -hmm. fantastic. It, you don't necessarily have to have an education in writing, but just Knowing more about the world is always going to be a good thing. From looking at your book, you've really got a kind heart towards the animals. Um, has the book changed you in any way? It has made me even more interested in the way we view non-human animals. And um, I'm working on another book. I don't really know what it's about yet, but I'm writing it. And uh, I know that a key, a key sort of element will be that relationship with non-human animals. We don't, we don't give them enough uh, credit or respect and you know I learned that probably from watching watching comets so closely for so mm -hmm. long but then just also you know just paying attention to to the actual even an insect the way it goes through its day you know it's pretty pretty remarkable. We just mm -hmm. assume that they're uh, something other but they're not. We're all, we're all animals. That's an interesting perspective. Now, uh, this book is going to be on sale at Peace FM, of course, but where right. else can people get a hold of it? Um, well, sadly, we don't have a lot of bookstores. Thank oh. goodness you've got one. Yeah. Um, so I think there's some copies in Coles in Fort okay. St. John. Otherwise, I think either through the publisher or through Amazon. Mm -hmm. Or what we will do is we will take it to the book shows, uh, too. Yeah. We'll take it to the trade shows. And you would be really welcome to come in at either trade show in Dawson Creek or Chetwin and shake hands and autograph books. Oh, well, thank you. And take the money. <laughs> thank you, you know, so much. I think that would be really good. Well, you know what, Donna? I really appreciate you well, coming thank here. thank you so much. And I love this book. And I wish you and Comet and Sally um, a great summer. Thank you so much. You're going to go out there. And I bet you anything when you see um, Comet, um, it just makes your heart. Yes, it does. Yeah. And there's a little tiny scar left. Uh -huh. And I just, yeah, I like just putting my hand on it and think, wow, you know, I, I helped. I helped that. Well, I was probably the cause of it, but, but I, that I doesn't helped. Matter. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. helped him recover. And it's, it's, yeah, it brings back, you know, in a way, uh, good memories. That summer taught me a lot. Yeah, I think it's really wonderful because uh, Comet, um, will remember you forever and ever. Amen. Because yeah. animals never forget. No, it's true. And, and you won't either. No, I Thank won't. Thank you very much for Thanks sharing so much. your story and Thank your you. book. Thank you. Thank you.
Mother Mary, she was on her knees, she had way less money, she had needs, she got caught stealing diapers at the corner store, and I said, well, well, what do we got here, five finger discount in a one way mirror, she'll do time, or Jesus will be led away, yeah, from the boss to the prophets and the angels go higher, three wise trips by an old campfire, praise the Lord, pass the admonition, God could love a child, in this condition, God could love a child. In this condition, God could love a child. In this condition, God could love a child. In this condition, go. Tell it on the mountain. Say, go. Tell it to the judge. Pray for freedom. Pray for mercy. If I sin, Lord, it was all for love. God could love a child in this condition. God could love a child in this condition. God could love a child in this condition. Cowboys, cowgirls, and cow kids rejoice. After far too long, Caribou Country is coming back to TV screens from sea to shining sea. Monday to Friday at 8 p.m., you can take a step back to a simpler time as the Smith family try to keep their small ranch afloat in fictional Namco, British Columbia. Paul St. Pierre's original, timeless tale of the Smith family ranching in Namco, British Columbia first aired in 1960, and Chet TV is proud to have the exclusive broadcast rights to this piece of Canadian television history. For a full list of programming, shows, and times, check the Chet TV website at www.peacefm.ca slash Chet TV and scroll down to the schedule. Don't forget, Chet TV is your station.